Hey, what's going on everybody? It's ETA Prime back here again. Today we're going to be taking a look at a brand new mini PC hit in the market known as the Morifine S800. What we have here is a 16 core, 22 thread mini PC from the company and their names are kind of similar throughout the years. So this is the uh, 2025 S800. Overall, still a pretty small form factor unit, a bit bigger than some other minis on the market, but this thing is putting down some really good CPU performance. Up top, you can see we've got kind of a newer design, a newer top plate. I figured there would be a little bit of RGB here because it does say Cyberpunk on it, which is a bit odd, but overall, it's not a bad looking design. Inside of the box, along with the S800, we're also gonna get a six foot HDMI cable, SATA drive adapter, because this will support a 2.5 inch drive internally, 120 watt small form factor power supply, and a vertical stand. And to tell you the truth, I love having a vertical stand with these mini PCs. Personally, this is how I always sit them up when they come with something like this, and sometimes even when they don't. But here it is installed with the stand, and all of the air is actually gonna be pulled in from the bottom and pushed out of the top. When it comes to IO up front here, we do have Thunderbolt 4. Now, even though it's marked USB-C, I think it's due to uh, licensing issues. It is Thunderbolt 4 running at a 40 gig protocol. We also have two full-size USB 3.2 ports on each side, not much going on, but we do have cutouts here for the air intake and exhaust. And around back, we've got our power input, four USB 2.0 ports, HDMI 2.0, DisplayPort 1.4, one gigabit ethernet port, and one 2.5 gigabit ethernet port. And of course, when it comes to the specs of the new S800 for more fine, this is powered by the Intel Core Ultra 9 185H. With this, we have 16 cores, 22 threads, configured with six performance cores up to 5.1 gigahertz, eight efficiency cores up to 3.8, and two low power efficiency cores up to 2.5. It's also got that Intel AI Boost NPU, Built-in Intel Art Graphics up to 2.35 gigahertz, and they will reach those clock speeds. In the past, when we've tested this chip, we could only really get them to go up to 1,250 megahertz due to, I guess, firmware issues when these chips were first launched, but this does boost all the way up to 2.35. This system does support up to 96 gigabytes of RAM. It utilizes SODEM DDR5 running at a maximum speed of 5,600 megahertz. It's got two M.2 SSD slots internally, plus we can add one 2.5 inch hard drive, Wi-Fi 6E, Bluetooth 5.3, and this comes pre-installed with Windows 11. Getting in here to upgrade the RAM and storage is pretty simple. There's two screws on the rear and we can lift the cover right off. It does have a built-in fan up top here to help cool down the RAM and M.2. Plus, if we added that 2.5 inch drive, it would help with cooling over there also. The other M.2 slot is located on the bottom of the board along with the cooler and fan setup. But getting in here closer, it does have a crucial drive pre-installed and crucial RAM. So I've got 32 gigs here. One thing I've always liked about these more fine mini PCs is the fan system that they use here. Sometimes the cooling system does leave a little more to be desired, but they use the larger blower style fans so they don't have to spin up so high to get airflow. So they're a lot quieter and they do claim that this is a very quiet mini PC, even at their maximum TDP. I wanted to jump right into the BIOS to see what we've got unlocked here. And uh, while not everything's unlocked, there are some very important things. Got our CPU configuration here. We can set up our boot performance. We're gonna go with turbo performance. Virtualization, speed step, you know, all that good stuff. Wake configuration, uh, you can wake by LAN if you need to. But the main thing is gonna be the configured TDP. And out of the box, this is set to 55 watts with a boost up to 65. So our power limit one or PL1 is 55, PL2 is 65. This is fully configurable from here. And in all actuality, if we took this up to around 85 watts, we could see a boost in performance, but I'm not sure how well the cooling system is going to handle 85 watts. So for this video, we're going to leave it right there at 55 and 65. A network stack configuration, totally disabled out of the box. And that's about it from here. There's also a firmware update section, but since this is a newer PC, we don't have anything to update. So we're going to go ahead and save changes, reset, and get right into Windows. So far, so good. And this is not the first time that I've tested the 185H, but it is the first time we can reach maximum clocks on the iGPU with this. 
In the past, I guess there was an issue with some manufacturers when it was released. It would only go up to 1250. With this, we can do 2350. As you can see, we've got that Ultra 9 185H, 16 cores, 22 threads. Wish we had faster RAM here, but you know, we're stuck with that SODEM up to 5600. We've got 32 gigs with this unit. Of course, we've got the built in Intel Art graphics, and uh, I guess automatically dedicates up to 18 gigs of memory. Checking out the TDP, like we saw, 55 PL1, 65 PL2. If we run this stress test here, right down, you'll see this jump up to 65 watts. And it does hang there for quite some time. The fan on this is not kicked up really high, and it's pretty quiet the way it is. It's got that much larger fan, so it doesn't need to spin up as fast to push more air. And at 65 watts, it's a great performer, but if we added a little more, we could get better performance for sure. And I also wanted to show you this, with those Intel art graphics, we'll stress them out, and right over here, 2,350 megahertz. In the past, like I mentioned, I was stuck at around 1250 with this chip, so we really couldn't see exactly what this thing could do. But now with this, we should be able to hit those maximum clocks. And uh, overall, not a bad little system. I mean, it's super fast. More than enough performance for everyday normal tasks, web browsing, 4K video playback, document editing. You could do some photo editing on this if you want to. But uh, one of the main things I wanted to check out was some gaming on this. But the first thing we're gonna take a look at are some benchmarks. When it comes to Geekbench 6, single core, 2,509, multi, 13,064. Not bad for 65 watts. I also ran Cinebench R24, and you can see single core is right there at 113, matching the M1 Max. But with multi-core, this thing's only hitting around 1,052, so it is coming in way below that M1 Ultra. Checking out some GPU benchmarks, and again, now that we can reach those maximum clocks, we're actually seeing some pretty good synthetic scores. 3D Mark Night Raid coming in with a 30,418, and I also ran Time Spy over 4,000, just by a bit, but we still broke that 4,000 mark with an iGPU, which is really impressive. But these Intel Arc iGPUs have always kind of scored high in these synthetics and sometimes fallen on their face when we get into real world gaming. So let's move over there now. Starting out here with Cyberpunk 2077, 1080p, low settings, XeSS set to balance since we've got that Intel Arc iGPU. Not too bad. We're seeing an average of around 68 FPS with this. That's a big hike over what we saw when this was initially released, and it really does kind of stay over that 60 mark. We could use AMD's FSR frame gen that uh, Cyberpunk has built into the game itself. It would probably help out a bit, but seeing how it's running right here, I wouldn't mind playing it like this. Doom Eternal, medium settings, 1080, 100% scaling, really good performance, and I figured it would be. I mean, it's definitely an older one, but uh, a lot of people are gearing up for Dark Ages. I cannot wait until that game releases, so I've been playing through this again, sitting at around 73 FPS on average. I also wanted to test out Marvel Rivals. Here it is at 1080p, low settings, XeSS set to balance. And even though Intel does have their new XeSS frame gen technology, unfortunately just doesn't work on these first generation for Ultra i GPUs. It would have been nice to be able to test it here, but at these settings, we're right there at about 66 FPS on average. Checking out Shadow of the Tomb Raider using the built-in benchmark 1080, low settings, average of 60 FPS by the time this finished. So from what I tested in the past, we were seeing an average of around 47. This is a real nice hike. And I'm sure some of it can be attributed to newer drivers here with this Intel Archive GPU. But on this 185H, those higher clocks are really helping. And the final one we have here is Spider-Man 2, 900p, low settings, XeSS set to performance. We could take it down to ultra performance and even add some frame gen using FSR frame gen, but I wanted to see what it would do and you can see it does dip under 60. So we'd probably have to take this down to 720 and at that resolution, I'd probably just take XeSS back up to balance.
The final thing I wanted to talk about here was total power consumption from the wall. So while doing all of my testing, I've got this plugged into a kilowatt meter to kind of get an idea. And this is in total, everything this many PCs pull in. At idle, around 11 watts. Average gaming it does jump up to 73, and we are in performance mode. And the maximum recorded was 86 watts from the wall. And as for CPU temps, average gaming, 71 degrees Celsius, and we did hit 89 degrees Celsius, but it didn't thermal throttle, and that was even running Cinebench R24. The cooling system they have here is great, and it is pretty quiet. I didn't hear it spin up super high or anything like that, but it would be nice to have some adjustment from the BIOS. That way I could bring these temps down, bring the wattage up, and not have to worry about it. Overall, not a bad little setup. I do like the way it looks, especially when sitting vertically in this stand here. That 185H is a bit older when you consider newer mini PCs on the market, but for CPU performance, it's putting down more than enough for everyday normal use. And given the fact that we can take the clocks up on that iGPU all the way, this Intel Arc iGPU is performing really well for what we have here. But in the end, it's always up to you. And if you're interested in learning a little more about the Morphine S800, I will leave links in the description. I might have one more video because I do want to connect an eGPU to this. Would have been cool if they added Oculink, but we do have USB 4 and we can use the Morphine G1 RTX 4090. So let me know if that's something you're interested in seeing down below. But that's going to wrap it up for this one. Like always, thanks for watching.